All right, so we're going through Acts chapter 12 this morning, and I think there's some good lessons that we can learn uh, from this chapter, especially when it comes to prayer. Uh, so when you're reading through that story, uh, this is like one of those interesting passages or one of these funny passages um, where the church is praying for something and they don't even believe what they're praying. Uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. So in, in Acts 12, see, when we were going through the book of Acts, we already saw one persecution of the church earlier on, which was by Paul, right? Paul, or when he was called Saul, was persecuting the church and you know, people were getting killed. Now there is Herod the king, right? Now this Herod that is persecuting the church at this time, when there's this, you know, I guess there's this famine going on uh, we learned about in the last chapter. This Herod is a different Herod to the King Herod that was trying to kill Jesus Christ. So I was reading up a bit about this, but basically, you remember at the time of Jesus Christ, right? Herod the king sent the wise men down into Bethlehem to find out where Jesus was and was hoping they would come back and then go kill him. So there's that Herod. And then there was his son, I think Archelaus, is when, when they came back. Remember Herod died, Archelaus was ruling, and his name was also Herod. So it's look, it looks like the Herod is like the family name, and it's like Herod something, right? So what I read is that this is Herod Agrippa, which was the grandson of the Herod that was trying to kill Jesus. And then the Herod, there was the Herod also that beheaded John the Baptist, which is a different Herod. And now it's this Herod as well. So it's a bit confusing in the Bible because they're all called Herod the king, but there are actually different Herods. And this is uh, Herod in Acts, who is now stretching forth his hands, it says here, to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So you don't really know in the first two verses why Herod is persecuting the church until you read in verse 3 when it says, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So Herod was motivated to persecute the church because of pressure from the Jews. That's why there's a lot of evil people in this world that are trying to appease the crowd, are trying to appease these you know, people that are trying to push their agenda. And then we see this in the world today. Right? We see this in the world where the, you know, the, the woke homosexual left is like pushing their agenda, right? And they're getting into politics and they're getting into schools and they're getting into councils. Like the last time we went to, uh, uh, what, what were we in the city for? We went to the city to go to the, to the museum, right? We went to the city to just go see this shark exhibition, which, you know, Another subject is, it wasn't really worth it. <laughs> may, as well, may as well just go to the aquarium, I think, and see fake sharks. But, so anyways, we went to the kids, went with the kids to go see this shark museum. And then all, all throughout the city, right, it's the rainbow flags, and then the rainbow on this, and the rainbow on that. And it's why? Because the mayor in Sydney is catering to these crowds, just like Herod is catering to these people to do wicked things, right? Just persecuting the Christians in the early church. So we see it happening back then. We see it happening now. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Now let's go on. Mark, six, Mark 15, 6. Now at that feast, he released under them one prisoner. Oh, so, so what I wanted to show you here, Mark 15, uh, 6 to 15. This is similar to when Pilate crucified Jesus, right? This idea of these weak leaders catering to these rabid crowds to do unrighteous things. Mark 15, 6. Now at the feast, he released unto them one prisoner, for whomsoever they desired. So you remember Pilate, before here, he was talking to Jesus, he was interrogating him, asking him questions, and he couldn't find any fault with Jesus, right? There was nothing worthy that Jesus did to be worthy of being put to death. So he tried to appease the crowd by saying, hey, well, at the feast, he's going to let a prisoner go. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. 
So he's saying, because every time this year, he releases one to the Jews. And there's the, obviously the picture here of the guilty one going free in place of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the gospel there. The Pilate answered them saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. See, so again, just like even today, it's always the minor there's a minority of very vocal people that are moving the crowds. And that's why even when I talk about, you know, in, in, in the political sphere, right, it's always like this, this fringe 5 10% on either side that are arguing for this squishy middle. And it's the same here, that they are, you know, there's this minority that is pushing their agenda. And unfortunately, you know, because they are louder, because they are more, you know, pressing, uh, these weak leaders bow down to this crowd. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? See, so even he knows, Pilate knows that this is wrong, what he's doing. You know, that he shouldn't be appeasing the crowd. But, you know, he's trying to. And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, look at this, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So even though Pilate knew that was the wrong thing to do, he bowed down to this crowd. And unfortunately, like I said today, a lot of people are doing that today. A lot of companies are doing that today. And it's no different, you know, with the homosexual agenda even the voice that is getting pushed now, the voice is this, it's this vocal minority of aboriginals that are trying to introduce racism into our constitution. And there's, there's people that are against it too. So we see it here, we see it today as well. Acts 12, 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternion of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, what is going on here? So, I was reading up about this. Normally, a, quater a quaternion of soldiers is four soldiers. And the idea is when you are looking after or you are guarding a prisoner, right, these four, qu these four soldiers will take shifts every three hours, right, so that they can, um, you know, look after this prisoner or every, what is it, um, throughout the day, every uh, six hours. But because Herod didn't want, you know, was, was keeping on a watch, I mean, it's four times the amount. So now with Peter, it's not just one soldier watching him every six hours. It is now four soldiers watching him every six hours. And when we read into the chapter, you can see that there are actually two inside the cell sleeping with him. And then there are two at the door as well. And then they, you know, cover ships. So that's the fourth quaternion of soldiers that are keeping Peter. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, this is the only time the word Easter is used in the Bible. And this passage is often used. And I talk about this at Easter time sometimes. This passage is often used to try and prove that Easter is some pagan festival. Right? Now, a lot of the things that people do at Easter may be based on pagan practices. And this is where I think the Easter bunnies and the chocolate eggs come from and things like that. But the word itself is not pagan. The word itself does not come from some pagan festival of uh, fertility and things like that. All Easter is, Easter the word is, if you know where it comes from, Basically, the history of the word Easter is before, before there was a word Passover, or whether there was a word Easter, which is an English word for the Jewish, what we call Passover, right? The, the Hebrew word is something like um, uh, Pas Pasach or something, P Pesach. Pesach. I don't know if that's the way you pronounce it. So prior to using the word Passover and prior to, prior to using the word Easter, they just transliterated the Hebrew word and then they just transliterated it, transliterated it into Greek 
and all that sort of stuff. That's all they did. So they just took the, the Hebrew word and they just moved it over. It's a bit like hallelujah. Hallelujah is not an English word, but it's sort of become a transliteration into English of a Hebrew word. Now, when Tyndale translated the Bible, because he was the first one to translate the Bible into English, at the time, the colloquial for that festival, for the Passover, was Easter in English. So that's why he used that term. He used that term Easter because that's what it was known as amongst English-speaking people, right? So then he used Easter in the Bible. And that's why in Tyndale's Bible, Passover in the New Testament is translated English in much more times. Now, you know, some people think, you know, was this an oversight by the King James translators when they were translating it? Was it just, you know, leaving some history there? Who knows why, you know, in this particular verse, Easter remained and everywhere else it changed to Passover, but that's the history of why this word is there. So in the New Testament, it was Easter. But when Tyndale went to translate the Old Testament, it didn't make sense to him that he would use Easter in the Old Testament because it was sort of like a modern word for the festival. So he's like using it in Old Testament times to refer to something that the Hebrews were doing as opposed to something in the New Testament. So that's, that's how the history goes. So Tyndale was actually the one that coined the phrase Passover. So he actually created that English word Passover based on the angel passing over in the book of Exodus and that now became the English word for that Hebrew word Pesach for the festival. But when he initially translated in the New Testament, he used the word Easter. So that's why that word is still there. Now, one reason why people think that Easter is a different thing to the Feast of Unleavened, uh, to, to the Passover, is because previously, you see in Acts uh, 12, verse uh, 3, it says here, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And then it says, then were the days of unleavened bread. So when Peter got arrested, it was the days of unleavened bread. So if you understand the festivals, you have the Passover, which is the first day, the 14th day of the month, Passover, and then the next seven days were the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the argument goes, well, if the Passover is the first day, and that's, I'm getting to it in a second, Passover is the first day, then Peter gets arrested during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? then Easter must be referring to something else, right? That's why people believe, well, Easter is some other festival that is not the Passover because the Passover has already passed, right? The first day um, before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But this is where they're incorrect because the word Passover can refer to different things, right? The Passover can refer to the actual lamb that is being slain, like, you know, it refers to Jesus Christ is our Passover. But... So I think the Passover, I'm pretty sure, I'm just going off the top of my head right now, but Passover can refer to the actual lamb being slain. It can also, but this definitely refers to, can also refer to the first day, right, which is that day the Passover lamb is killed. But Passover also refers to the whole period of time, right? So the Passover was also the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And this is what I want to show you here in Luke, so in Luke 22, 1, see here, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called, look at this, the Passover. See, so you have the Passover day and then you have the days of unleavened bread, the feasts of unleavened bread, that is the Passover period as well. So this is why when he's saying intending after Easter to deliver him to the people, that is after the Passover. There's nothing wrong there. It's not this other festival. Acts 12.5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So what I want to mention here in the first part of Acts chapter 12 is, you know, when Herod went after the church, he went after certain in the church to vex the church. But who did he go after? He went after the leaders didn't he? And that's why even when we saw, remember when we went to the protests and all that sort of stuff, they go after the leaders, they go after the spokespeople, they go after the people that are gathering the people together because 
Why? Jesus says here in Matthew 26, 31, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Right? So, when, sometimes when there's persecution that comes down, it comes after the leaders of that movement. It comes after the leaders of the church. So I think it's very important, like here, when persecution came on these leaders, what did the church do? The church was praying for Peter. Now, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but look, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So. What I want to say is, you know, I think it's very easy to be critical of leadership, right? You know, you know maybe you guys might be criticizing me, that's fine. You know, I can, take, I can take some constructive criticism, it's okay. You know, I do the same, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, uh, you know, when I used to work in the corporate world, you know, you complain about your, your boss, you complain about how things are, you complain about things. It's very easy to be critical of people because sometimes you know you don't know what it's like to walk in their shoes but criticism can come externally and internally right and that's fine there's nothing wrong with constructive criticism but what I'd like to say here is you know but I hope also that you pray for me as well you know it's one thing to be critical about the things I do or the things I say and you know I'm, I'm not perfect either but Let's not forget, you know, like that it's, it's not always easy to be a leader and we should pray for our leaders. And I'm not just saying this for my sake, but in any area of life. Because, like I said, it's always easy to be critical of the people that are trying to lead and putting, their, putting their, uh, themselves out there. But I think we have to remember as well, you know, let's pray for them. Because oftentimes they're the ones taking all the arrows. They're the ones taking all the heat. So... You know, I just wanted to make that point there. I was thinking of that. Yeah, hey, they're praying for Peter. Hey, I hope you guys, you know, it's all right to, you know, be critical of some of the things I'm doing. But I hope you pray for me as well. All right, let's go on to the second uh, part of uh, Acts chapter 12. This is the prison break. <laughs> the prison break. When Peter gets out of prison, Acts 12, 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison and behold the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side so you can imagine this angel's coming waking Peter up raised him up saying arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands now, I don't know if you can imagine the scenario in this jail cell, but remember, he's get, being guarded by four quaternions of soldiers. So it's four soldiers looking after him. It's not one prison guard that's like down the hall, doesn't know, really know what's going on. You know, he's a fat prison guard sleeping on his chair. He is actually sleeping together with these prison guards in the prison. You know, they're chained to him. So this is obviously a miraculous escape from prison where the chains fall off obviously the, the the guards are still in a deep sleep the angel said on him gird thyself bind on thy sandals so he gets dressed and so he did and he saith unto him cast thy garment about thee and follow me and he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision so peter is not realizing that this is this is real what's going on he's thinking that am i just like having a vision here like he had the vision of the sheet coming down he's having a vision of him coming out of prison but he doesn't know whether this is really happening or not you know when they were past the first and the second ward they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which opened to them of his own accord and they went out and passed on through one street and forth with the angel departed from him. So it's not that he's just the chains come up, it's going through gate after gate after gate until eventually he's led out of the prison and out um, through the gate of the city. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people. So that's what's going on in this chapter but I want to make a spiritual application to what's going on here because see the church is praying for Peter and Peter is almost in this impossible situation because I mean he's in prison he's guarded by four prison guards I mean they're sleeping alongside him and 
you can imagine that it's hard for the church to believe that what they're praying for is possible. And you see that challenge later on. Right? They're praying for something, but they don't actually really believe what they're praying for. And why? Because the situation seems so dire. It seems so impossible that how could Peter be delivered from this? But if we apply this situation spiritually, it should encourage us because it shows us in this, in this example that when we pray for something, prayer can help you escape a seemingly impossible situation where you can't see a way out. And, you know, in this instance, it was actually being imprisoned. It was actually a physical persecution. But if we apply this spiritually in our life, there are other things that people feel bound by and they just don't see how they're going to get out of it. You know, maybe it's some sort of habitual sin. You know, like people that are just bound by drugs or an addiction. And they feel like this situation where it's just they just feel like they, they, it's impossible for me to break out of this but this should encourage us that if we pray to god god can help us out of these seemingly impossible situations and it may be drugs it may be depression you know where it's somebody's struggling emotionally and they can't pick themselves up they can't get, pick themselves out of a ditch. But I think this passage is encouraging us that, well, if we pray, you know, even if we don't pray in full faith, God is still merciful and can bring us out of these seemingly impossible situations. I mean, what about where habitual sins of fornication? You know, maybe some people are in a relationship and, you know, they keep falling into the same sin. Or, you know, pornography is one as well, where, you know, men or even women, they watch pornography. It's just something that they can't stop watching and they keep finding themselves in that situation. And, you know, that happens to people more often than you think. And this is why when you, sometimes when you read in the comments where you watch videos of men trying to encourage people to get off the porn pornography and, you know, stop, uh, you, know, uh, you know, masturbating and all that sort of stuff. They're trying to encourage each other because it's, to them it's, it's like something it's hard to break out of. and It's something like an impossible situation. But this passage can encourage us that you know, through prayer and through not just your own prayer but praying for one another. See, notice that it's, it's, it's not just Peter praying for himself to get out of this situation. The church is also praying for it. And that's why when we put our prayers on the prayer list and we share our struggles with one another and we say, this is what I need prayer for. If we like the church here, you know, even, even not even in 100% faith like the church here, God still intervenes and helps and gets us out of that seemingly impossible situation. So it may not be a habitual sin, you know, when it comes to like drugs or fornication, pornography, emotional, could be a financial hardship. You know, people just don't know how they're going to make ends meet. You know, or, you know, a, a complex relationship situation. They just don't know how they're going to make it work with their spouse or with a family member or relationships in their workplace or friends and you name it. But there are situations we find ourselves in and we just don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think this passage is an encouragement that if we pray and if we pray for one another, the things that are outside of control, our control, God can make a way. I mean, look at, look at uh, Peter going through the prison. I mean, it was door after door after door, how impossible it was for him to get out of that situation. But... God made a way. And this is what the Bible teaches us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Look, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So a couple of other things on this story. So we talk about, you know, God saving us from, you know, a seemingly impossible situation. 
But also, you know, God can open the doors. But you must walk through them. You know, there's a saying that it's, it's, it's impossible to help somebody that won't help themselves. And, you know, that's true of life issues, like emotional issues, depression, you know, work, job. It's like a, it's like a homeless person. They don't want to help themselves. It's very difficult to help them. But it's the same in your spiritual life too. You know, you want to grow. You say you're not growing, you're not learning. But nobody can help you if you don't want to help yourself either. The opportunities are there. The ministries are there. The things you can do to grow in your spiritual life. But if you don't want to grow yourself, how can, how can you be helped? It's like here, God can open the doors. God can, God can take the chains off. God can open the doors and provide a way for him to escape. But what if Peter just sat there in the prison? He just wanted to stay there. He didn't want to take the way out. And he's still going to be there. Right? So it's not, hard. it's not easy. You can't help those who won't help themselves. If Peter didn't get up and walk out, then he wouldn't have escaped. And spiritual growth is the same. You know, no one can make you grow spiritually if you yourself do not have a desire to grow. Another thing is, look, prayer did not prevent Peter from going to prison in the first place. You know, so prayer doesn't mean that you're not going to have any trials or tribulations, just like in 1 Corinthians 10. You know, we don't pray because we, we don't fall into temptation, don't fall into trials and temptations. The trials and temptations come, but the prayer helps us to overcome, doesn't it? It helps us to overcome the trials and temptations. That's another lesson we can learn from that. A couple of other things were the thoughts that I had when I was reading this passage in Acts 12. Do you know that Peter was kept in prison until the day he was to be killed? Right? So remember he was kept in prison and intending after Easter to bring him forth. But it was the day that he was going to be brought forth to the people and put on trial. That's when the angel comes and saves him from the prison. So things aren't always resolved quickly just because you've prayed for it. You know, like sometimes we pray for it, we pray a week, two weeks, and then we say, oh, you know, God's not answering my prayers. Yeah, well, maybe Peter thought the same thing. Church is praying for me, I'm stuck here. Eh, God's not answering my prayers, God's not hearing. But then right before he's going to get delivered, that's when that prayer is answered. That's when he's delivered. That's when it happens. So sometimes answers to prayer don't always happen in our timing. And sometimes we give up before we should have. Right? I want to show you this example here. This one was, has always stuck with me because, you know, having children is, 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 is a big deal, right? It's very important to people. And, you know, people, they pray for a child and we're praying for people in the church to have children as well. You know, another person that was praying for children? Isaac. Because, you know, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was barren. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebecca to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Padamanaran, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. So you think, oh, well, that's... That's, that's, that's nice. It's like you think people that are struggling with a child. It would be great if that was the situation, right? He just entreated the Lord, and then his wife conceived, right? But let's, let's read on. And the children struggled together. So this is talking about, you know, she's giving birth within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, they, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they, uh, oh, sorry, just, just thinking of my own child, they come out, they're all hairy. Uh, they, came, they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. Look at this. And Isaac, look at this, was three score years old when she bare them. So do the maths. He took his wife, Rebecca, who was barren at 40 years old. But then how old were they when they had their first child, their first children? 60 years old. 
So this idea that Isaac just prayed once and his prayer was answered, this guy is praying for decades and then his prayer is answered. So what I'm trying to encourage you today is when you pray for something, don't be discouraged because you pray for a week, a year, and your prayer is not answered because it's not over yet. And just like Peter, prayer was not answered until the day almost when he was going to get killed. Sometimes God's timing is a little different to ours. And here, you know, Isaac prayed for 20 years before his wife conceived and then they bear Jacob and Isaac. So, Peter was kept in prison until the day he was to be killed. You know, things aren't always resolved quickly just because you prayed for it. Um, but you know, help was sent due to the prayer of others. And like I said before, you know, your prayers for each other make a difference. Philippians 1.3 I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. This is Paul praying for the Philippians. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, Paul is saying, hey, hey, it's meet, it's suitable for me to think this of you, that God is going to you know, build you up and edify you and he's going to perfect you because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all are partakers of my grace so we want to pray for one another like it says in james 5 16 confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much and the last thing i just want to say on this story is you remember when peter got out of the prison you know how he was walking through the doors and it was like he wasn't really sure was this was happening or not. And it wasn't until he got out of the gate that he realized, now I know God has delivered me from this. That's like in your life as well. Sometimes when you're going through the trials and as you go through each individual thing and you don't know where the light is at the end of the tunnel and then you get out of it, then when you look back, you can see how God has delivered you through all these things. So I think this story is a great story to encourage us to pray, to pray for one another and to know that you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel if we pray to the Lord. Now, let's talk about faithless prayers because this is the interesting thing here in Acts chapter 12. It says here, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. There were many gathered together praying. So we can see here in the Bible, gathering together for prayer is a biblical practice, right? When churches get together, they pray and they have a, have a prayer meeting. And you can see here, the mother of John Mark, whose name was Mary, and she was generous enough to put up a home that, where people could gather there and put them up to, to pray. So I think her name is mentioned here because of this, but she's also the mother of John Mark. And I don't know if you know John Mark, but he's pretty famous because he wrote one of the Gospels. All right, so John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was one of Paul's disciples. So not all the four writers of the Gospels were apostles of Jesus Christ, right? You had John and you had oh yeah, Math, uh, Matthew was as well. But Luke and Mark were disciples of Paul and they wrote some of the Gospels too. So John Mark was greatly used of God. At the end of this chapter, you can see that he goes on to travel with you know, Paul and Barnabas. But you can see why was John Mark a righteous man? Well, it must, a lot of the influence could have been from his mother because his mother was a woman of prayer and a woman that was very generous to the church as well in terms of her hospitality. So it shows that John Mark had godly influences in his life. Acts 12, 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. They're saying to Rhoda, you're crazy. So we're in here in the room praying for Peter to be delivered from prison 
Peter gets delivered from prison, but they don't, they don't believe that he has been. So it shows that they weren't actually believing the things that they prayed for. So we can take the lesson here that we have to pray in faith, believing. That's not an easy thing to do, right? Prayer is not an easy thing to do because it requires a lot of faith. Because what you're doing when you pray is you're saying, I am completely leaving it up to God to do this. Because you don't tend to pray for things that you can't control, that you can control. You pray for things that you can't control. And that's why prayer takes a lot of faith because it's something that you can't control, that you are asking God to help you. So here, they don't even pray with full faith. But God is still gracious where he answers their prayer and delivers Peter out of the prison. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Right? So, this story, like I said, is the classic example of praying for something, but you don't actually believe what you're praying for. And all of us struggle with this. It's a hard thing. But we've got to pray and trust that what we are praying for is possible with God. Look at what James 1.5 says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavereth. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So it's natural to doubt when we pray not fully believing that we may not receive the things that we ask of but God is gracious as well when we ask him of these things now what sort of things should you pray for see when you pray to God I don't believe you should pray for things that you can control you know you're not going to pray to God you know of you know what uh, you know to put your clothes on in the morning because you can just do that you know, you don't pray for the things that you can do. What you pray for, I believe, are the things that you can't control, that you have to commit to God. Like Philippians 4, 6 and 7, this is one of our memory verses, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's one thing we pray for. We commit things to God. Another thing we can pray for is that we, God can help us with the things you can control. So yes, you can go about things, but you're asking God for additional help with the thing that you can control. But you're not asking God to help you do the thing that you can do, right? You're asking God to help you in the thing that you do have control over. Ephesians 6.18 Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So this is Paul telling the Ephesian church to pray. Verse 19, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So he wasn't asking for prayer to preach the gospel, but he's saying he wants utterance, he wants to know like wisdom, to know what to speak and to speak boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So another thing we need to pray for is we need to pray according to the will of God. right? So we pray for the things we can't control. We pray to, to be helped in the things we can control. But we also need to make sure we're praying for things in the will of God, like the Bible says. 1 John 5.14 And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So how do you know whether you're asking something according to the will of God? Well, you need to know what the Bible says. Know what the will of God is. The will of God is, is, is in the Bible. But this is also a conscience thing as well. See, when you, when you pray to God, do you ask yourself, is this just something that I want for me to serve me? Or is this something that God wants that's going to serve God? Right? So you have to ask yourself these questions. You know, am I asking something in the will of God 
Or am I just asking something for my own loss? For my own is up because I want this. I, I need this. James 4.2 Ye lust and ye have not. Ye kill and ye desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your loss. See, a lot of prayers from people are just selfish things. Right? They're just things that serve their own purposes, serve their own pleasure, serve their own life, make their life easier. They're not praying for things that God wants. But maybe our prayers would be answered more and we would have more confidence that God is hearing our prayers if we are asking things according to the will of God as opposed to just to our own will. Like Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. All right, let's go on. Test, uh, do this last section of this uh, chapter, Acts 12, 18. Herod's judgment. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And, and you can imagine, right? Because they know their life is at risk. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down to Judea, to Caesarea, and there abode. So you can imagine the situation. How, Pe how, did, you know, how did Peter remove the chains? when he was sleeping next to these, these, uh, these prison guards. So it, I think it would be understandable that Herod probably believes that there's like a mole in the, in the prison because, you know, he's, he's guarded by four guards. They're sleeping in there with him. The chains are undone. Well, who undid the chains? He's not expecting some sort of supernatural prison escape. So you can understand as well now in Acts 16, you know, where we get the verse, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Remember the, the Philippian jailer came out. He came out trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas. Why? Because we get the precedent here as well in Acts 12, that if a prisoner under your watch escapes, they are killed as well. Right? He examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. Verse 20. Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. So what's going on here? Herod's displeased with these other countries that he's ruling over, so they come to appease him, right? And while he's there, he, upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. It's like a speech. The people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So this story is very similar to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, it says here, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, All this came upon the king, Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. While well, the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and I shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth, to, giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird claws. So he was actually, he lost his mind. He went out into the wilderness. His hair is growing, his nails are growing like an animal. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom is from generation to generation. So what's the, what's the lesson here? Right? Herod did not give glory to God, and neither did Nebuchadnezzar, and they were punished for that. So we need to make sure when we achieve things in our life, we should give God the glory, not take the glory for ourselves, because this is what happened to Herod and to Nebuchadnezzar. So the other thing is, See, we don't know if Herod just died immediately or whether this was like a slow death, right? as he, he got sick and then eventually when he died, the, the worms ate it. It seems that when you read it, the death was sudden. 
right? And it reminds me of like, you know, all these health bureaucrats that are talking about the vaccines and then they just like, <laughs> they just like keel over. And some people wonder, you know, is that, you know, them, uh, you know, t tasting their own medicine, you know, with all, with all the, the vaccine effects that are happening uh, and, and vaccine injuries. But the other thing here is, because we're talking about prayer in this chapter, that, you know, I'm sure the church was also praying that this evil man was being removed. And it seems as though their prayer was answered, you know, in a way that they didn't expect, you know. So he was removed from how he ended up dying because he didn't give God the glory. And then when we read the next last two verses, Acts 12, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem and they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So we see here, this is how John Mark joins their ministry. So you may not even realize an event occurred that was an answer to prayer. Because did they know that this happened? That, you know, he went to go speak to these people and they go, they just probably just heard. I just heard that Herod passed away, you know, when he was visiting these other countrymen. But we know, from God's point of view, that they were praying for you know, to be delivered from this evil person. And we see in Acts 12 how this evil person was removed from the trials and tribulations that the church was experiencing here. And persecution can lead to positive things. The word of God grew and multiplied, just like we saw when the church was being persecuted during COVID. You know, the word of God grew, church grows, people get more in tune to the things of God. And you know, the early church here continues to grow even after two periods of persecution with Paul and now with King Herod. Um, and we already talked about John Mark. So, in conclusion, what's the lesson here today? I want you to take away some lessons. One is, I hope you guys pray for me, you know, and others in position of leadership for boldness and protection. Because like we see here, when the church was vexed, certain of the church were vexed. And it was the leaders, right, that were usually persecuted first and cast in the prison. James was killed with the sword. Peter was going to be killed. But the church prayed for him and he was delivered. Number two, make sure you are praying for one another. See, it's not just about Peter praying for himself to be delivered. Sometimes we have struggles and things in our life and if we pray for one another that will make a difference you know you need to believe that and that's why this 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 chapter is here to not only encourage us to pray for one another but to also rebuke us when we pray not really believing what we're praying for like the church was praying for peter you know he was at the door and they think rhoda is mad and then it just shows that they were praying for something gathering together did not even really believe it was possible when it happened. God, number three, we learn as well, God doesn't always answer prayer in the way you expect, whether it's the timing, whether it's the method. Sometimes you may not even know that it was an answer to your prayer, but we know if we ask for things according to God's will, he hears us. And the last bit is when you achieve things in life, like Herod, don't be like Herod, don't be like Nebuchadnezzar and take all the glory. That's your opportunity to give God the glory. And you don't want to fall under the judgment of God if you don't do that. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and uh, just thank you for the encouragement. Help us to be a praying church. Help us to pray for one another. Help us to have the faith to believe what we pray for, and also, Lord, that our prayers would be according to your will and not ours. So we thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.